Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Before I set out to make this week's argument on national interest, my customary appeal, which hasn't gone out for some time, so to that extent, I've been complacent. And the appeal is the usual one, which is that independent media like us, the unhyphenated media like us, need support from wonderful people like you, listeners, viewers, readers. So if you have taken a paid subscription already, please top it up and renew it. If you haven't, it's time you paid something towards independent free journalism because you know nothing that comes for free is of, of much value anything that comes for free is loaded the kind of journalism we do costs money we have people tra traveling all over the country in fact we are the one organization that's kept the eye on manipur constantly sending people out there all of that needs money much of that money comes by way of subscriptions from you. So once again, please take a paid subscription. And, and if you have done so already, please do top it up. That said, I make my case for this week's national interest. This week's argument isn't about cricket. It is about geopolitics in India's neighborhood. Therefore, it begins with cricket. There is no reason. There is no reason for India to go for the ICC Champions Trophy in Pakistan. All pressures to do so should be tossed. The only prudent course is to seek a venue change. This isn't an issue of liberalism, hawkishness, nationalism, friendship or hostility, or any rekindling of the Sark spirit. Now, what was Sark? It's forgotten and buried right now, unfortunately, or maybe deservingly. It is straightforward. This argument is straightforward if cruel pragmatism from an incorrigible cricket fan. Playing in Pakistan at this juncture won't be good for India, Pakistan or the great game of cricket. There will be some ifs and buts and obvious whatabouts. These do not matter. I will also deal with some of them as we go along. Pakistanis say they came for the ICC World Cup in India and India happily play them in neutral venues. So why not in their country? The answer is simply that their country isn't in shape to host something where the stakes could be so high. This isn't an issue of bilateralism. It is about getting your act together, particularly when anti-Indianism runs so high among the followers of the only political force with mass popularity with street power, that is Imran Khan's people, and they are the ones who've, who've been kept out of power by the powers that be right now. So they are angry. And a lot of Imran Khan's politics is built on anti-Indianism. Even a whiff of an incident like the violent 1989 shirt ripping attack on the Indian captain, then Indian captain Krishnamachari Shrikant by a Karachi spectator would be ruinous. It would set back the ties further, be devil an ongoing tournament and harden Indian attitudes on playing Pakistan anywhere at all. If the regime in Pakistan isn't in control of the street, Public opinion in India is also fragile. The old nostalgia and cricketing affection for Pakistan are mostly dead in India. And it's important for both countries and for the game of cricket to de-risk. If the subcontinent is the new home of world cricket, where anything about 90 to 95% of its spectator base lives. In fact, a recent ICC survey said 90% of spectators of cricket live in the subcontinent, but I would say it's between 90 to 95%, closer to 95. Then the current state of its geopolitics is a tragedy for the game. It's a curse on the game. Pakistan has just seen an almighty protest in its capital involving fatalities. Bangladesh just lost the hosting rights for the ICC Women's T20 World Cup, which was shifted to the UAE because of political instability there. Cricketers in Afghanistan, whose cricket is improving most significantly in this subcontinent, can't even play one game in their homeland. In fact, they've never played one. Pakistan is the only country where visiting cricketers have been attacked, and not once but twice. 
Besides Srikanth 1989, the terror attack on Sri Lankan cricketers during his second test match in Lahore in 2009. Much has improved since then for sure. All other test playing nations have been routinely visiting Pakistan, having peaceful tours and many international stars play in the Pakistan Super League or PSL. For India to be there, especially in this uncertain climate, is too risky for all sides. And I say this without any, any sense of being judgmental. They will be Indian support staff, they will be Indian diplomats in attendance and also in transit and some spectators too. For the committed mischief maker, this will be a target rich environment. We can anticipate the familiar arguments of competitive cussedness that you Indians were so rough on us also. Your hospitality also wasn't brilliant when our team, that that will come to the, from the Pakistani side, that when their team came for ICC World Cup, India's hospitality wasn't exactly brilliant. They were the spectator and journalist visa issues, partisanship of the crowds at Ahmedabad, the barracking of Babar Azam and Mohammad Rizwan and others. Unfortunate as it was, it gives an indication of the troublesome possibilities with India in Pakistan now. Sometimes when a relationship is so fraught, it is wiser not to expose it to elements you cannot control. It's important, therefore, that India and Pakistan at least keep playing each other in ICC tournaments wherever both sides feel safe. Unfortunately, we seem headed the same way with Bangladesh as well, where our men and women have played full red and white ball series recently in a cordial atmosphere, cordial, happy atmosphere. Barring, barring the usual competitiveness on the field. It was tragic for cricket, but also indicative of the deteriorating geopolitics of our neighbourhood that while 12 Bangladeshi cricketers listed themselves at last week's IPL auctions, none was picked. Not one was picked. That hasn't happened since the IPL was launched. The franchises weren't hesitant to pick the Bangladeshis because of any lack of talent. There are some brilliant players there. Many of them have been regulars in IPL in the past. It is just that everybody weighs the political risk now. Add fan emotions to that. There can in fact be an IPL index of the evolving geopolitics of the region. The Pakistanis were not only welcome but sought after and celebrated until 26-11 after which the obvious lack of remorse on the part of the country's establishment which persists to date broke the hearts of the team's most diehard fans in India. In fact, I will just give you a time reference. 2008 was the first IPL, the first, the early part of 2008. Pakistanis came and played there. Later in 2008, in November, came 26-11. And that's when this relationship broke. Bangladesh, most unfortunately and sadly, has joined that category now, though we hope that this is temporary. See in contrast, the two other cricketing members of the neighborhood who've always starred in the IPL. Sri Lanka, which not only has players but also coaches and match officials now, and Afghanistan, for heaven's sake, which accounts for some of IPL's most popular performers. Six of the ten in the auctions have been picked and one has been retained. So at seven, this will be a large Afghan contingent. The broken cricket relationships in the subcontinent aren't about cricket but over the state of these nations. These are delicate, very delicate relationships. Pakistan chose to drop that porcelain jar with 26-11 and hasn't even made a pretense of making amends. Its perpetrators roam free and the only reason they haven't struck again in a major attack since 2019 is India's post, post Pulwama red lines. That India will retaliate deep inside their territory and if this risks war, so be it. The nuclear bluff was called with Balakot. Nobody in the Indian subcontinent or among the larger public believes that Pakistan has got over its idea of using terror as an instrument of state policy. It most certainly, most definitely hasn't dismantled its terror infrastructure. With the Indian public opinion, sorry, with this Indian, sorry, with this Indian public opinion, it is tough enough just to host Pakistan at ICC events or even to play Pakistan at ICC events at neutral venues. Sending a team out wouldn't be courageous. It will be outright reckless and foolhardy. I, idea, ideas like the Indian team arriving in the morning, playing and returning in the evening are cute, but they only worsen the picture. 
check out check out this november 18 tweet from american strategic scholar and region specialist christopher clary he wrote see this tweet on your screens he wrote both pakistan and bangladesh find themselves in situations where the current regimes seem unsustainable but there is no pathway to a sustainable regime this one sentence underlines india's predicament our big neighbors to the west and the east have regimes running on short and uncertain leases, sort of on daily wages. Anti-Indianism rules the street. In Pakistan, there is clarity on who's got the strings around their fingers behind the curtain. For Bangladesh, we can't even say with confidence that General Bakro Zaman, the army chief now, is the boss. The Dhaka regime is sui generis in the subcontinent. This is the first time that the voluntary slash NGO sector has taken charge of a country that to a country of 176 million, about 100, 162 million of whom are Muslim. It doesn't matter whether Muhammad Yunus is a good guy or a bad guy. It is instead, where is he headed and what or who will come after him? Anti-Indianism will only take him that far. History tells us these things do not end well. Bangladesh, with an already evolved economy, fine social indicators, in fact, excellent social indicators and per capita incomes heading to be twice Pakistan's, will ultimately land on its feet. India will then work that much harder to repair this, this relationship with Bangladesh. Pakistan, currently in the throes of its most unstable phase since the protests throughout Musharraf in 2007-8, is looking at much greater trouble. That's why it isn't even in its own interest to risk whatever goodwill it might still have on the Indian team's visit or to make it a political issue. Since Pakistan calls Urdu its national language, it might be in order for me to read out a line from Gulzar to them. Remember the song from Khamoshi? And then, then it goes on, Sirf ehsaas hai ye roos hai mehsoos karo, pyaar ko pyaar hi rehne do. So I will make a best effort translation and, and a concise translation which would replace the word pyar or love with cricket and counsel patience. Leave emotions untouched, they are raw, let them be as they are until the time is right for a cricketing love affair. This isn't that time.